Thank you very much, Mr. Brown, for that report. Uh, Chris Thomas, would you like to add anything? Or? No, I think uh, the chair should tell us that we're not going to keep it. Thank you. It's really encouraging to hear also that you are working through the uh, uh, 50 points of the Friends of the Earth. And it seems that it's a really serious thing here that we have council officers as well as our members uh, combining forces and actually getting on with it, and especially at this point that you mentioned in terms of the notions, so that it's not just an exercise where we pass them, but that we are actually doing something with them, so that there is an action point from that. Thank you very much. And our final report comes uh, on low carbon economy, and that's from Councillor Joe Dunn. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, so we, we met um, last Monday. It was uh, Chris Walsh um, and Corey, and obviously it was Dan Hardy. Uh, I appreciate Dan Hardy's actual input into it and his uh, knowledge on the subject. Um, in terms of the discussion, we highlighted the uh, key priorities that we would take moving forward. Um, and we did establish that um, the green economy for the Pearl City Council um, we have the, the least control. Um, what we did establish is that uh, order is currently in the place uh, to establish the green, the green businesses within the city, uh, the effectiveness, uh, how we grow, what, what's the implications of it, how can we help out. Um, there are also green substantial um, services and signposts for the business in place to assist the businesses. So there's also uh, funding available from the combined authority. So we, I think that's something we're really looking into to try and assist the businesses going forward. Um, what we will be doing as well is we want to encourage businesses to actually look at um, what can be done, um, the sustainable power they use in uh, independent businesses, how materials are sourced, and uh, we really want to kind of encourage um, businesses to shop locally, um, which is also good. Um, we've been looking at heavy industry, the uh, power consumption for, was a major issue uh, for the north of the city. Um, what we also be looking at is the uh, national and international businesses uh, reducing road traffic, encourage people to change um, ways to shop. <coughs> we'll be looking at in infrastructure for providing uh, sustainable power solutions, which is the best way to move forward across the whole of the city. Um, uh, we also did talk about the solar panels for local businesses and seeing which, if it's effective for certain businesses and the cost that goes with it, uh, some programmes are currently in place. Um, they're obviously dependent on the uh, power requirements of businesses and also the structural issues for some businesses involved. Um, what we also want to do is raise members' awarenesses in regards to the uh, low carbon economy task group. Um, the membership currently as it stands is me uh, and Councillor Sarah Morton. Um, Councillor Billy Lake has expressed an interest. Uh, I encourage members to, we need one more, I encourage members to be able to join that task group. Um, and moving forward, we'll be looking at the, um, the best way to actually promote the green agenda for businesses in the city. Uh, in regards to our first action meeting, the task group will meet, um, it'll be the January to the end of January. Uh, and what we'll be doing in that task group is there's going to be a presentation uh, and we're going to be looking at where green businesses are in the city. Uh, like I said before, we'll be seeing how can we improve their methodology in terms of packaging and stuff like that. Um, what options in terms of support that are available to the green businesses moving forward. So obviously, the combined with our general funding um, that we might be able to tackle to for them. Um, there will be a report on the challenges facing um, businesses on the agenda and how we can support them moving forward in uh, the most cost, cost effective way. Uh, and we will also ask for input from elected members at the meeting. 
Uh, we have also invited the school parliament along uh, and obviously moving forward. Um, we have been encouraging businesses to actually make the meet moving forward and discuss ideas, uh, what they're comfortable with, issues that might be surrounding certain proposals. Um, Thank you very much for that detailed report. Could I just, before I bring you Laura in, just to ask, there, um, uh, Darren Harvey, Hardy or Hardy? <coughs> Hardy, if you would like to add anything. Okay, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to thank all four of the chairs for, especially at this busy time, the amount of work they've already done or at least planned to do. Um, and I'm aware that all four of them are doing that on top of their many day jobs that they've already got. So I do genuinely thank you for taking on that role. Um, if there's problems with membership, then maybe the chair and I could work with you to chase people down. And um, with regard to the waste one, seriously, it might be helpful to one the waste authority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which I'm obviously one of them that gives you a choice. Yeah, Tony yeah. or Councillor Hanson as well, if you, yeah. if you want nothing. I know that's not helpful with the gender balance, but council yeah. circles. Um, yeah. So, but if there's any other problems with getting members along, then I'm sure Lena and I could work together to encourage people to attend and support that work. So, thank you. Uh, I mean, my thinking is that I would like to attend these meeting, meetings if possible as an observer, so that to get some insight into what is happening. I mean, I'm just here now looking at uh, the next two um, dates for our meetings and just thinking, you know, what's actually reasonable to, to ask of the task groups, because our next one is on the 3rd of February and then we have 23rd of March. I had this idea that maybe we would ask two presentations per meeting, but I'm not sure if a lot can be done until the 3rd of February. So just to think, what are your thoughts, members of the committee, in terms of how do we move forward? Do we ask, because obviously uh, we want to have some reports within this year before we move again into a new year. So do we get, take all four reports? on the 23rd of March as to what happened or do we want to have two in February, two in March? Any ideas please? Councillor Dunn? Um, as I previously said about the uh, task group, there's obviously an old company place to establish the green businesses within the city. Uh, I don't know if that was coming out, how long that might take. <coughs>
Thank you. I think because we have quite a lot already on air quality and we are going to get uh, some information on Mersey uh, travel as well, it's probably best that your report then goes in March and the other one on built and uh, natural environment goes in February. So that's great um, that, that we have that schedule in place in terms of reports for the next two meetings. Thank you very much. So. Um, uh, so can we move on? Is this uh, enough for the updates on the, four, uh, on the four task groups? Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, really express my thanks to all four chairs and for the supporting council officers um, for all your work there. And we are going to move now on to uh, item number five, which is a presentation of the MERS site travel overview. And can I please invite Councillor Liam Robinson, Chair of the Merseyside Travel Transport Committee, to introduce a presentation providing an overview of the activities of the Mersey Travel. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. I'm going to start by thanking you for inviting me along this evening to present to you. I'm genuinely, well, myself individually, but Mersey Travel Command Authority collectively, I'm more than happy to do anything that we can to assist the work of this committee, particularly Lawrence's task and finish. Because of all the crises in this country and this world now facing, this is by far the biggest one, because it's, this is existential. Uh, I've put together a presentation that will hopefully take about 10 minutes or so, and then the bit that I think will be most helpful is moving into some questions, some thoughts, ideas, and discussion, and we can get into much greater detail potentially as well. So let me start with a little bit of a recapitulation um, because climate change and air quality issues are not really new for the city region. If we look back in time, as you can see from the slides, uh, the buildings used to be covered in soot from a time when everyone had an open fire and from a time when most of the industry had a smokestack uh, involved. Um, because things seem a lot cleaner, because the pollution isn't as visible, it's no less problematic, actually. And I really like the image that we put on this slide here that Sadiq Khan is using in London, where it actually shows and highlights the kind of pollution that you find on a baby bottle. I think that's really powerful because if more people could see things like that and realise the effect that it has on some of our most vulnerable residents, in this case, uh, young children, actually that would really give a great focus on the fact that we have to do something. Transport has a huge role to play in the sort of carbon challenge. Um, if you look at those graphs, um, effectively the sort of impact of carbon emissions from transport is growing in the city region. That's for two very practical reasons of proportion. One is the fact that industry actually is cleaning up its act, it's improving and emitting less carbon, but also because of traffic growing uh, over the past few decades, absolutely that's adding to the problem. So we know we have to do something about it from a transport perspective. Equally as well, uh, I'm very conscious of the fact that um, we talk about climate change and climate emergency, we talk about the air quality uh, issues. They are not the same thing, but they are definably two sides of the same coin. And actually, a lot of the solutions that we need to put in place are extremely similar. And when we think about the impact of transport on air quality, <clears throat> again, in terms of uh, nitrogen dioxide and particulate matter emissions, again, transport impact is growing, partly because of uh, the way that industry is cleaning up its act, but also as well because of the increase in diesel traffic across the region, things like buses, taxis, uh, vans, trucks, and so on. So we really need to kind of address these things from both a climate change perspective, but also an air quality perspective, because they are, as I said before, definably the two sides of the same coin. I thought it'd be useful just to put this slide up, because one of the things that the naysayers often say about this whole agenda is that it's not a priority, or it's unpopular. People might kind of think about it, but they don't really want to kind of buy the bulletin and deal with it. I thought this would be quite useful to put some strong evidence that we're getting about how people do see this as a priority. The Cabello Authority is currently engaged in what we call LCR listens, uh, which genuinely is a sort of outreach exercise going out across the region, speaking to the residents of the region. And particularly when we're talking to people about what their priorities are, they are indicating 
that pollution and climate change and those issues genuinely are a priority towards, uh, for them. They're also telling us that actually we see there's an important need to move away from petrol and diesel vehicle traffic as a key part of the pollution causes in the region. And that as another way of doing that, they want to see improved public transport and improved active travel, particularly things like cycling. It's really heartening, I find, that actually we're not getting a lot of comments from people saying we need to kind of make it easier to drive your car around. So I think it's really important that we're highlighting this because if we're going to have to take bold decisions, and we will, this gives us the evidence that our residents want us to have the courage of our convictions. So what are we actually doing and what are we going to go further and do more of? Well, quite frankly, we need to reduce car usage and private vehicle usage. That's the only way, from a transport perspective, we are going to address climate change and air quality. Key to that has to be active travel and we're working very closely with all six district councils on a very radical vision of promoting active travel, particularly cycling. We've got a very bold programme of potentially up to 300 kilometres of high quality segregated cycling infrastructure to be delivered across the city region in the next four years. This can't be a nice map that sits on a wall, this has to be something that is designed and then delivered. The first tranches of that we've already committed £9 million of funding towards, particularly in the city that will see a significant upgrade and new uh, infrastructure from Speak up to the city centre, but a number of other corridors we're focusing on beyond that. We also know that actually it can't just be about putting the infrastructure, that is key, we also need to give people the skills to confidently ride bikes. I'm very proud of the fact that we still deliver the largest programme of bikeability, so cycling proficiency in old money, of any part of the country, and in the past couple of years, 8,000 kids across our region have gone through this programme, particularly focusing on those coming from primary school to senior school uh, ages. And we wanted to maintain that because we know how important that is. You all know how important City Bike has been in the fact that compared to other cities, actually it's beaten a lot of its usage forecasts and it's still in place and a key part of the transport mix. And a comment was made earlier about the great work that Simon O'Brien is doing as the Cycling Walking Commissioner in Liverpool and the city of Liverpool, so much so we've extended his remit to cover the whole of the city region. I met with him earlier on today. I have to say, the map that he showed me is very, very exciting. I think it's great that we've got such a fantastic local advocate who's pulling together some very, very visionary plans that we have to deliver on. Obviously, active travel is key, but public transport is a really important way of getting people around. Uh, buses have to be at the heart of that. I'll say a few things about trains shortly, but still 80% of our public transport network and usage is on the bus. I think we've got a, not a bad story to tell. Uh, over recent years, patronage on buses locally has grown. It's up by 16%. We're one of the few parts of the country where more people are getting on the bus. That's for a variety of different reasons, focusing on things like the quality of vehicles and trying to improve the services. Particularly one of the things that's been extremely successful, and it's fantastic, Mary's here, because she should be one of the ones that takes some of the key credit on this, is getting a much better deal for young people. The fact we've been able to reduce the cost of travel for young people, the fact is up there, we've increased the number of young persons' journeys across our region by 168%. We should be damn proud of that. We've doubled the number of kids on buses. We do want to go much further than that. And we're currently going through the very detailed process that legally we have to go through to utilise the devolved powers that were given to us. Uh, well, given is the wrong word, returned to us because there were powers taken away from us in the 1980s actually to regulate buses and put the passenger at the heart of what we want to do with the bus network. I could spend hours boring you about that. That might be another presentation further down the line. But in February, we will be bringing forward our recommendations about how we will be using those powers. One of the key components of that is a zero emissions bus fleet by the 2030s. We know that actually this isn't about getting more people on the bus and out of private cars. Let's make sure as they're going around, the bus is not causing any problems to the environment through what comes out of the, the exhaust. 
starting point of that will be 25 hydrogen buses that we've procured that will be going to service in 2020. Uh, we're very lucky in this region that actually in Runcorn we've got some industry that produces hydrogen as a waste product. Why are we allowing that to bump the chimney into the sky when we should be powering our public transport network with that? So we're really excited about how we can utilise that. Moving on to the rail network, um, we do have some positive things to say on the rail network. Um, in the next couple of weeks, hopefully the first brand new publicly owned rolling stock for Mersey Rail uh, will be with us. The train spotters amongst us, the first number is 777001, uh, should be with us very soon. Um, we know that those brand new trains will really kind of improve the attractiveness of the Mersey Rail network. Again, I could void it is for hours about that. The key point I would highlight is the fact we'll have level access and a sliding step at each door. We will treat disabled people and anyone with an accessibility issue as equals in a way that has never happened on a heavy rail network anywhere else in this country. Because these vehicles are also lighter, they will use a lot less electric energy and we will be trialling battery technology. So the potential for some of those services to extend to places where the railway is not electrified like Wrexham, Warrington, potentially beyond the curve with Skelmers Day, really gives huge opportunities. We know that will get more people onto the rail network. Over the past year, we've seen some new services. For the first time in 40 years, brand new services from Wales because of the work we did with really the Holland Curve and the great work we're doing with the Welsh Government. We'll be getting even more direct services into Wales. This last weekend, the first direct trains to Glasgow and Edinburgh. 20 odd years started. Um, we've also been able to secure in principle commitment to trains now down to London, something we've been arguing for for a long period of time. So, some brand new services. Whilst there's positive news, I wish I could say the same about Northern Rail. I can't. I could write a book about why that is falling apart, and one of the things we're arguing very, very strongly is the recovery starts when Northern gets shown. Equally as well, longer term, we're focusing very, very hard on what we call Crossrail for the North, uh, the government called Northern Powerhouse Rail, a brand new high speed loop for the city region, linking us onto HST. That will give us lots of benefits, but crucially, will give us brand new rail capacity so we could actually put more services for local passengers on the conventional network, but also utilise that for people of clubs and threat. Because one of the things we're doing a lot of investigation in is how can we improve the movement of goods and freight across our city our region because it's absolutely vital. There are lots of different things we are looking at. We're working at with Highways England on an electric van pilot where effectively they're going to provide us with a fleet of electric vans that we can loan to local businesses so they can understand how actually moving to electric can be better for their business as a really good way to get them to, to buy them in the fullness of time. We also think there's huge opportunities for urban consolidation. If we were to go out around the city centre particularly in open backs of vans, you find that most of them are nowhere near full. How can we reduce that traffic by actually kind of consolidating more of that freight and goods movement accordingly? Lots of things as well around scrappage that we're looking at, how we can work with all of our district colleagues on things like scrappage schemes for the taxi fleet, for example, and other polluting fleets. We also know there's huge opportunities to extend smart ticketing. Uh, believe it or not, the walrus card that some of you might have uh, used to use to travel around the, the transport network locally, after the Oyster card in London, actually is the highest used transport card in the country, but we know we've got so much further to go. We are rebranding that as the Metro card, we will also be rebranding, well, refreshing the transport brand across the network. We'll be keeping the yellow end, but we'll be moving trains, buses, and also potentially ferries to that metro brands to make it much more integrated because actually people want an A to B integrated journey. They don't want to be kind of looking out who runs that bus, who runs that train, for example. And then so finally there's a lot that we've got to do on the potential for um, speed management and livable streets. We've got a great record here in the city of Liverpool with 20 mile an hour zones. I have to say there is real enthusiasm to spread that across all residential roads across the city region, which I think would be a huge behavioural change for our whole region. And frankly, slowing the traffic down would lead to less emissions, and it's something we want to push on with Highways England about where the motorway network intersects the region 
is there the potential to reduce the speed on some of that network from 70 miles an hour down to 60 miles an hour to help improve emissions and air quality accordingly? I'll finish with a few pictures because I think it's quite nice. Um, because some of those things are nice ideas, we've got a good track record. Up there, we've got Wayne High Street from the Car Free Day. Angela and Laura and others did a great job. That needs to be much more commonplace. And I can think of a number of streets, including one in my own ward, where we wanted to do exactly that. Again, we've got great heritage. That's the 1960s on Church Street. That's it today. If we've got the courage of our convictions, we can make more of our public spaces like that. Final thoughts I'll leave you with. I think this is a great quote from the Mayor of Bogota. If you can read it in the back, if you can't, I'll read it out. That a developed country is not a place where, poor, where the poor have cars. It's where the rich use public transport. And my God, that has to be true. Final bits that I think we need to sort of say. Um, we really need to kind of win some hearts and minds here. Probably the most extreme example over recent decades is people's attitudes towards smoking. I appreciate this is different in some ways, but actually it's just as important as an emergency for our lives and the livability of our planet going forward. There are a few things we all need to do. Everyone has a part, part to play with this, but I would say we, I mean city council, both councils and offices, have to lead on this, because quite frankly, I have very little faith that the government re-elected last week will actually play a leading role on this. If we are prepared to have the courage of our convictions and actually uh, practice what we preach, and that means all of us being prepared to get out of cars, get on buses, ride our bikes, not only can we lead by example, but actually we'll take much better decisions. If we actually take decisions from the view from the top deck of the bus or from holding handlebars, you actually end up with better decisions than if we don't do that. And the final, final bit I would say is when we're looking at the highway network, if we're going to answer this question, and we have to, then actually we need to be thinking about whenever we do anything on the highway network, how do we prioritise sustainable transport? To put it as crudely as this, how do we get more bums on seats on buses and more bums on saddles and bikes? Simple as that. I hope that's useful, but more than happy to get into a wider Thank you very much, Liam, for this uh, inspirational um, report, actually. And I love that idea that you had there, that it's about the movement of people and not vehicles. Of course, we all have to kind of think differently and think slow, and kind of develop a slow sensibility as we are moving through, through places, uh, such as slow travel, which, which you know, provides a different way of thinking about the world as well. Uh, so I'd like to invite questions from members to uh, Liam, Councillor Liam Robinson's presentation or comments. Okay, mm -hmm. so we have two here, we have a Councillor Brown and Council, uh, all, all three, we have a Council, the two Council Browns, Lawrence <laughs> and uh, Chris, and then we have a, a, a Councillor Joe Dunn as well. Yes? Oh yeah. Okay. Thanks, and thanks to Liam for that uh, report. Uh, just to refer back to the question I did raise before, specifically about the um, 75, 80 and 86 D bus routes that um, could be in the mix as far as possible changes are concerned. Um, I'd like some clarification on that if possible. Um, also, you mentioned about uh, up to 300 um, kilometres kilometers of um, cycleways. Um, hopefully that means nearer 300 than um, but I think that's good quality type of way as well because uh, high quality type of way because um, I think it's clear from most people uh, when you speak to them that the reason they don't cycle more is because or at all is because of safety on the roads um, and that's a straightforward simplicity one. Um, you can do as much bike ability training as you like but if you don't get that safety from your adults then you're not likely to get people carrying kind of that cycling. May I suggest that we hear three questions and then let you answer, just for the sake of our time. Thanks, yeah. Um, <clears throat> in regards to uh, rail, it is obviously in cheap because the boot branch is fine, that's been shut for quite a while. Um, I think it's been reported that um, Anfield and the pool are putting proposals in to actually expand the ground to 10,000 more than I 
I think it's 60,000 or 70,000. Uh, as obviously it is the limit on where Anfield can expand to, because obviously as it continues to expand, there's going to be more congestion, not just in Shoebury, but in Anfield and, and surrounding areas. And there's a, obviously there's a real demand for a rail, uh, railway stations across there. Um, I know there's obviously there's structural problems with it, it's a very complex issue. Um, I do believe it is in the combined authorities long term plans, what I've read. Um, but can you provide an update? Could that get cut shorter as demands are obviously increasing? About Mersey Rail, uh, avid user, uh, um, glad to see the new stop. Obviously, we'll have uh, new disability access, uh, and that's great that people can get on off the stations. But uh, to actually get into the station sometimes is the hardest part. Um, have you got a, an update in relation to rail um, station uh, improvements, particularly you know, you take places like Edinburgh, Crescent, and stuff like that? Uh, you know, you can't even get down the stairs. Um, um, so, I don't provide an update in relation to that. Um, echoing uh, Joe's point in terms of, in, in terms of uh, 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 transport and uh, resources in, in an ever-growing city, in large part, um, you know, it's really quite hard to get any kind of transport. Um, I think in particular, my part of, in my world, it, it's around by Gattaca, parts of Chilwall, uh, you know, you're only relying on things like the HTL buses, which come every few days. Uh, and uh, there's a great opportunity, I think, with things like a click, for example, uh, that I think they're doing, uh, which are quite innovative in the city. Uh, we've got any plans to kind of work with them to expand their services. I know that in Garston, they've now taken over the Garston Circular. Is there any opportunities to meet with them uh, and uh, look at them providing uh, additional services in parts of the city where people can't necessarily get into the, to the city centre? Shall I set them in, in number order? Um, Lawrence, in terms of the city centre connectivity um, stuff, I haven't got the full detail of how services will operate because that's still being worked out with the, the bus companies. Uh, but the vision very much is to retain all of those services, particularly accessing the Hanover Street corridor. I have to say, I think us doing the consultation that we did has been very, very helpful. Um, yeah, we're, I believe this is wrong. But uh, consultation of bus services is not a statutory requirement. We're about the only city region in the country that absolutely does that. And I think by having the very detailed com um, conversation with people that we did, with the thousands who actually engaged with it, has put into a position to make sure we get a much better outcome than if kind of pointy heads like me sort of sat in ivory towers saying this is how it should operate. So the vision very much is to retain all those services. We still have to work all that through. Uh, with the bus companies, and a lot of it is dependent on the capacity that the bus gate will, will give us, but that's very much what we, we're aiming to, to do. In terms of the bike network, the 300 kilometres is very much the combined authority aspiration, over and above the district aspirations, absolutely. I think when you look at the great work that not only Simon's doing, but actually Joe's been matching with the money, it will go much further than that kind of 300 network will fan out across the, the region, there will be a lot more detailed stuff on more local roads. The 300 kilometre network, if, you, if I was to use this phrase, you have to kind of, it's the, the super highway bit, it's the longer distance type stuff, so it has to be about the whole kind of behavioural shift. And the way I kind of look at it, and the reason that we're so focused on the four year target, is Seville is a good example where they have a 10 year target to roll out a significant cycle highway network. Now obviously Seville's climate is different to ours, but it's absolutely more extreme. You know, it's got a desert climate in the summer. Um, they were able to roll out their super highway network in two years. So we should be able to do it for if we're serious about that. Um, Joe, in terms of the brutal branch line, um, yes, we are doing feasibility work of how we potentially could introduce a passenger 
service to that. It's very much a manifesto commitment of Steve Rather, um, so he's particularly keen on that and we're doing the, the detailed work. Um, that's been commissioned. Um, one of the things that makes it slightly more complex is the Bootle branch line is the main rail route in and out of the port of Liverpool and with the expansion of the port we need to utilise that as much as possible for the movement of goods and freight in and out of the port. Um, mixing passenger trains with freight trains isn't always easy because freight trains tend to be slower and tend to sort of slow down the passenger trains but that doesn't mean that it can't be done but that's why we need to do the feasibility work on um, how it could be done what infrastructure would be required because you probably need to electrify that line and then also what stations would be required on that line and what service you then operate but genuinely the feasibility work is being done and we know how important providing a rail service to that part of North Liverpool would be to those, those communities so it's certainly something that we're, we're focusing on. Chris in terms of the points about station access you're absolutely right if we've got a fully accessible fleet of trains we do need to move towards a fully accessible network of stations. About 62% of the city region's rail stations are step free, which is better than if we were having this conversation in Birmingham, for example. But it still shows there's a lot more that we've got to do. We have got funding for additional five stations across the region. Two of those are in Liverpool, Broad Green and St Michael's are the next ones that we're going to put some lift into. But we are looking at how could we roll out the plan to every station. Traditionally we've depended upon government funding and government is particularly parsimonious uh, on these kind of issues because in simple terms to put a pair of lifts in at a station to make it step free costs about two million quid. Uh, we think that you'd be looking at more than 100 million to get the whole city region network done. We should aim to do that but that just gives a bit of a, an indication of the cost but also that it would take time to do. And then finally, in terms of um, bus service coverage, I think we see the developed powers have been a huge opportunity to actually get a better coverage, particularly at times of day. One of the things within the vision of using the developed powers is on each route having at least one uh, service an hour between 5 o'clock in the morning and midnight, and 15 core routes, things like the number 10, the 82, the 79, being 24 hour routes. We think that's really important. The vision. However, demand responsive transport can be a part of, of that. Um, you're right, the read click services um, is quite interesting, pretty good in filling a different sort of gap. So, what role could that play within utilising the devolved powers and you know, whether it's them delivering it or whether it might be another demand responsive operator? It you know, could be an opportunity for local taxi firms, for example. So, it could well sort of be something that we can, we can factor in. But happy to kind of have that conversation if you think it could be a solution in your world. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Liam. Uh, we, do we have any more questions from the members? We have uh, from Council Coleman. Anyone else? Because we are kind of running out of time as well. We need to move on. Uh, Council Coleman, you've already asked your question. So I will move on to Council Coleman now. Thank you. You're absolutely right. I'm never on the record of saying how extortionate the cost of bus fares are locally because there's a flat fare policy that the bus companies have in place. Um, being fair, £2.30 to get all the, way, all the way to St Helens, that you could argue that's good value. To go up the road to the Royal Hospital is frankly scandalous and that needs addressing. Um, when you look at um, other parts of this country, for example, in Bristol, uh, a lot of bus fares were cut and that generated quite a bit of patronage growth. Nottingham's a good example where the bus fares are more affordable. But more closer to home, all that stuff we've done with my ticket and reducing the price for under 19s, it's nothing scientific. If you make something good value, people will use it. It's quite straightforward economics at the end of the day. And actually, for me, this is really important as a kind of social justice issue because 
if, it's, if people can't afford to use it, then they're missing out on so many opportunities. And even those people that can afford to use it, it's not good value, they don't. They do something different. So a lot of the work we're doing on the devolved uh, powers is what is the right approach to ticketing and fares and how do we get the best deal. Because I actually think there's an opportunity by which you can have a fair structure that's more affordable, that actually gets more funds on seats, but ultimately you can generate more revenue. Um, I'd like to think that then there's the opportunity to go even further. If we've got a better result last week, we would be looking at three for under 25. So how can we look at what would be the right way of getting a much better deal that actually makes public transport and bus travel by far and away the first choice of people who walk past the car that might happen to be sat outside the house. Thank you very much. Okay, may I please ask the members to collectively thank Councillor Robinson for this presentation. Is that agreed? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to move on to item number six now which is question time and you should have all have in front of you uh, the questions that were asked from the public and that um, uh, councillor member of the cabinet councillor robertson collins has provided answers to okay can you all have a look at that i would just like to note that there is a lot of questions that are coming from the public around emergency and we do have members of public attending this meeting as well so from my perspective as a chair I do have to note that this is a, a very much a public issue and that also some of the members were also asking for example in terms of having public question times and uh, issues like that or even a scrutiny committee that is made of public as you may know in Birmingham there are going to be citizens um, assemblies around uh, climate emergency, so it's very much not just an issue for the council, but obviously for the citizens. So, um, you know, my thinking is that there ought to be at least city conversations around climate emergency where members of public can be engaged. Obviously here, as you can see, the structure is such that we are scrutinizing the work of the cabinet member and thinking of what the council is working, but we also need to have some mechanism, I believe, where the members of public are heard, and that this is a kind of a democratic, more democratic uh, issue where uh, public are involved. I mean, uh, that, that, that would be my suggestion, that there is some, at least, city conversation on this issue. Is that a reasonable uh, request? Yeah? Okay. Uh, any other thoughts from the members here of the committee in terms of these uh, questions and answers from public? Or do we just agree with them and so they will become uh, public then on the, on the internet, on, on, on the website? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, just to say that um, as far as the one is concerned, transport and air quality are concerned, we will be looking at those a bit more. Here to maybe comment on this on the process what happens. 